Jaleel, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being on the Everything Saxophone podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You have been a fan request, so um, I'm honored that you're here. And gosh, you've you've performed with so many people. You're a solo artist. You have your own record label. We're going to dig into all that stuff and more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but first, you know what I'd like to do? Um, I'd like to get into your journey as a saxophone player, as a musician, and um, I'd love to know, when did you first start getting involved in music? Was saxophone your first instrument or was something else? No, saxophone was not my first instrument. Uh, I, I first got involved in music probably around the age of, uh, I want to say three or four. Wow. Um, yeah, my, my, my mom had me, well, first my mom was always playing music in the house, you know. Um, when I got older, old enough to, you know, realize what was going on with, with the music that she had was, I realized that it was everything from, you know, John Coltrane to Stravinsky to wow. Bob Marley to Michael Jackson, you know, and a lot of saxophone, you know, back then I realized she, when I got older, I realized she had Ornette Coleman and Yusef Latif and Gary Bartz, and she was playing all that when I was a kid, you know. Um, Wow. So around, I guess when I was around three or four, maybe, or maybe even younger than that, maybe three, she took me to this class that was kind of like a theory class for children, like a beginning introduction to music class for children where, you know, you just play the little xylophones and, you know, kind of like an ear training class and just, you know, just, just like a fun class for children. And one day uh, she told me that one day the teacher came out and said to her, you know, I think you should you know, keep him in music, I, you know, I, he's, he's really, he's really got something, you know, um, special. And uh, so my mom had me start uh, Suzuki violin lessons at around four. And, uh, you know, that didn't stick, that didn't last very long. I feel like I may have played it maybe a year, you know. Um, and then from there, I took drum and piano lessons when I was in, in uh, kindergarten maybe you know um wow. for a little while and that stopped um after a while you know i'm a kid i'm you know she had me doing different things she had me taking art classes and all kinds of things when i was a kid um finally when i was around eight eight years old um i was in i guess the third grade and um a teacher a, a, a man from a you know one of those band um band uh, companies, you know, that, 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 you know, you get the musical instruments from, he came to our school and he showed us a musical video of, uh, it's a Disney video that shows the evolution of musical instruments. I, I don't know if you know that. Wow. Video. Okay. But, I don't, I don't remember. I'm just amazed at how much you remember. <laughs> like I'm thinking yeah. myself. You know I what? Mean, because I've told this, I've, I've, I've definitely told this before. But, but but I definitely remember that video. And the crazy thing about that video is to go back, I think the one thing that got my mom to even put me in a music class was when I was a kid, she took me to see Fantasia when I was really little. And um, years later, maybe two years later, she took me to see, uh, or maybe a year later, she took me to see uh, uh, the Nutcracker, and she and she, she, this is a story that I'll never forget because she tells it all the time. But she she tells me how, you know, during the Nutcracker, I kept saying Mickey Mouse, Mom, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse, <laughs> and she didn't understand why I was saying Mickey Mouse, you know. <laughs> and later on, she realized that you know some of the movements from the Nutcracker Suite were in Fantasia, and. But I had seen that a year ago. Wow. And she didn't buy me the record for it or anything. I just remembered the music from a year ago, and I remembered Mickey Mouse. So that was something that... And, and the, the, the funny thing is how it came around full, full circle, because later on, when I rented Fantasia, you know, well into my, uh, you know, 20s, you know, late, maybe late teens, I rented it. And 
that video is actually the the, the short cartoon, the the, the 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 cartoon about the evolution of musical instruments. That's the short cartoon that they show before Fantasia, you know. Oh. So it was pretty deep, you know. Looking back, I'm like, man, that's the video that he showed me when I was in eighth grade. Oh my god! And you know, he said, "Who wants to play?" And I, my hand raised up, and so the first. Um, you know, first he said, who wants to play? I said, I want to play. And I went back to my mom and, uh, you know, because he said, you got to go back to your mom and ask her if you can play a musical instrument because she had to rent it, of course. Yeah. So we sat and we talked about what musical instrument I wanted to play. And, you know, we I think I wanted to play drums first. And I think she wasn't for that because it was uh, probably too loud. And so then I said trumpet. And I think she didn't wasn't really crazy about that. And then I said saxophone. And then when I said saxophone, she kind of like, yeah, you know, she said that, that that'll be cool. So unfortunately, they didn't have saxophone that year. So I played clarinet for a year and then I switched over to um, saxophone. And I took, uh, I took uh, classical saxophone lessons for maybe about a year or two until my uncle saw that I was like really you know, consistent like I was playing. And he told me, he told my mom that there was a um, a youth jazz ensemble being run by an, a man named Lovett Hines that he thought that I should, you know, I should try out. And he said, you should take him down there. So my mom took me down there and um, right away, I just like, you know, I jumped in and it was, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience. There were so many great, you know, young, musicians you know coming out of philly um some of them were just leaving that are like doing you know they're like you know very well known um musicians uh christian mcbride joey de francesco people like that um and um i just you know from then the ball just really started rolling you know and uh i was i was um as i, I switched over to a jazz teacher couple jazz teachers. Um, I ended up with a guy named Rayburn Wright at the, at the end. Oh. Um, well, he, this might be a different Rayburn Wright than, I don't know if you know the saxophone oh. teacher. Okay, no, Wright. maybe not. I, yeah, when you said the name, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know that name. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was studying privately with him and I was going to this, you know, this, you know, uh, youth ensemble every weekend. Uh, that was run by Love, Love and Hines, and I was with my peer, like a lot of young musicians my age that were really into the music. And um, from there, just like, you know, wow. things just really developed really fast. I'm curious, um, this is so fascinating, and, and uh, what I'm starting to see is the effects of the influences. So your mom was a huge influence because she had you listening to music from birth <laughs> right <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't just one genre of music right. it was it was a wide variety of music right and then you know taking you to to shows and stuff like that and mm -hmm. what really is striking me is how you remembered seriously how you remembered you know like uh fantasia and then the nutcracker and then that video um do you have do you have perfect pitch or just very good relative pitch uh i think it's very good relative pitch I've, I've never really, maybe I should do some, I don't know if there's a test that I, that I can see. I, I think I have good relative pitch though. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason why I'm, I'm saying that is because I was just thinking to myself, um, your your uh, your recall is it has to be really, really incredible. And just listening to you play, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, um, so just the fact that all those influences already happening for you and just the fact that you know, your teachers recognized something and, and uh, you were you had something available to you, you know, with a local um, youth jazz band. It's funny because, you know, uh, I'm, we were talking beforehand, I'm, orig I'm originally from New York and on Long Island, we have those types of things. You know, we have mm -hmm. a really good Nassau Suffolk performing arts um, uh, started by Bill Katz, you know, great mm -hmm. jazz educator, musician and stuff. Um, since I moved out to California, I don't really see that here mm. it's the the there's i definitely see a lack of you know um ensembles and activity for for young students and it's a shame but um i think that's that's so awesome um so 
you mentioned that you were studying privately with some people, which is great. How were how was your music? How was the music program in your school and stuff like that as well? Did it support you or? Um, it did. I I I um. I mean, I, I feel like a bulk of it was from outside. I mean, there was you know there was a performance. There was a you know I I, I went to a couple high schools, uh, or maybe I should say a, f a, a few because. Overall, I think I was kind of not always 100% happy with the public school system. Okay. Um, and, and that being said, I did have some great teachers in the public school, to, you know, the public school system. I had a great flute teacher, um, Diane Clark, um, at Gerard Academic Music Program. But, you know, I was so, I was so um, engrossed in the Philadelphia jazz scene by the time I was like 11 years old and I was embraced by them and I was learning so much by them that, you know, you know, when you get to the public school and you don't have the same support that you have outside, you know the difference, like you know what it is, you know, and I think that that was something that stuck out for me was just like, you know, I had met most of the jazz um, community by the time I was like 12 or 13. Wow, you know, that's and incredible. I, and I was, yeah, it, it it was it was really great. It's something that I'm so thankful for, um, just to be able to, you know, it, it was a kind of environment where if I went to anyone's gig, you know, in Philly, and you know, and, and looking back, like, I mean, I shouldn't say looking back because I I I I realized this probably when I was about to leave. Like, man, I've been playing with some of the masters while I'm in Philly. Like, you know, the great Shirley Scott was living there and. I would go play with her and, um, and you know, Mickey Roker and Bootsy Barnes. And, you know, it was a situation where if I went to the gig, to anyone's gig, I had to have my horn, you know, like you couldn't, I couldn't go, like none of the young musicians could go to anyone's gig and not have their horn because you were going to sit in. Wow. You know? And those situations were just priceless, you know. Um, and I think that that's what I mean by, by like, the school system was, it was, it was cool, but I think compared to being, you know, really immersed in that jazz scene the way I was, and I shouldn't even say the jazz scene, it was the music scene, because it's, there was so much other music going on, there was hip hop, that the roots were around, and they were coming up, and, um, uh, you know, I was playing different music, uh, like, uh, I played uh, a, a saxophonist named Bobby Zenko had me playing in a merengue band with him. And, you know, I got to play with a great R&B singer named Billy um, Paul when I was a kid. And so it was just like the music scene was just everyone knew each other. Everyone was playing together. And it was, you know, it was so um, in, in inspiring and encouraging, you know, that... Um, <laughs> I think that was like such an important part of my development is just having those great musicians. And, you know, my mom was like everywhere, you know, she took me to every, you know, by the time I was 16, I was probably taking, I was taking drum lessons, clarinet lessons, flute lessons, uh, piano lessons at one point and going to this ensemble. And my mom was taking me to, you know, she was there, you know. Wow, so, how did you handle all those instruments? <laughs> That's well, crazy. I think, you know, I shouldn't say I was taking them all at the same time. I might, I may have been taking saxophone and, and drums and flute. And then, at, and then at one time the drums may have stopped. Then I would take saxophone, drums, piano. And then, you know, my, like my last year of high school, of high school, I was literally probably only taking flute, you know, flute lessons. Wow. Okay. So then how, I mean, you know, this is an, a Captain Obvious question, but, you know, I'm sure taking drums, I'm sure taking piano really helped you, you know, with your musical development. Yeah, it did. Um, the piano, I wish I took more, honestly, because I, I took, I, I think that's, those are the lessons I took um, the least uh, were piano lessons. But um the drum lessons definitely, and it's funny because I didn't realize it until I got into high school. I mean, I got into college, and you know, um, I started understanding how I was, how how my approach to rhythm was, you know, when I was playing, you know, and um, and when I started teaching much later on, um, 
and trying to explain some things about syncopation and, and time to my students and trying to show them things rhythmically, I realized that I was coming from, I was taking things that I had learned in, the, in those drum lessons, you know, years ago, you know, that definitely helped. I mean, I don't have a drum kit now and I haven't sat down in a drum kit in, you know, over 20, 20 years, you know, since I was in high school, but they definitely helped. For sure, and and you know, um, I'm just thinking too as you're writing your own music, as you're, you know, leading your own bands, um, and even being a guest with other bands and stuff. I would say that you're probably more attuned, more attuned than most people would be who haven't had drum lessons. You know, you understand what the drummer is doing. Like when you had the drum lessons, was it typical? Like you know, you're studying rudiments and all that kind of thing, or were you getting yeah. it? Okay, were you getting into also jazz as well on the drums too? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that. I mean the, the the funny thing about that that was short lived too. That you know that was maybe a year, you know. And the funny thing is like the drum teacher like basically told told me told me and my mom like, and I, I wish he didn't pick, just based on how much I actually learned. But he told my mom like you know he you know, um, maybe this isn't a thing for him. And I don't think he even knew that I was like it was just like kind of a side thing for me. It was like okay. you know I'm taking m multiple instruments, but. You know, um, I was still practicing saxophone and probably at the time, you know, flute more than I was the drums. But I was practicing, you know, I just I probably wasn't coming in 100 <laughs> percent, you right, know. Right. But um, I think in that year, you know, I I really picked up I picked up a lot, you know, and I, you know, um, there's a book called Syncopation that um, a lot of drum teachers use. And, you know, I kept that book and I kept, you know, practicing with a practice pad for a long time, you know, after after those lessons. And that that helps. That helps a lot, you know, for sure. And um, when I was teaching elementary band, I think I know the book that you're talking about. Um, I think I can kind of see the cover in my in yeah. my mind's eye. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I now oh, I'm curious, too, because I guess looking back, when at that time you're taking some drum lessons, all that kind of stuff, did you notice how it was starting to affect your your improvisation? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. And I I think that's something that, as a young, you know, as a young man, you know, in high school, like, uh, there are a lot of things that I, I you know I was just practicing it. You know, but I think I, I wasn't conscious as to how it was affecting me. I just I was just practicing and playing, practicing and playing, you know. And then later on, like now when I practice, I'm more aware of how before I even practice it, like how it's going to affect my playing. And, and you know, I'm trying I, I try to be more conscious of where I can utilize, you know, some of the things that I practice. But back then it was just like I'm just taking the lessons in there. I'm absorbing all this information and, you know, it comes out how it comes out, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, so you've talked about the people that were influencing you at the time. Who are your, who are your other influences that you've listened to? That, like, let's say if they were alive today, you would love to play with, you know, perform with them, and which songs you'd love to perform with them. Um. Uh, well, some of them are still alive, uh, okay. for sure, and and um, you know. For one, you know, like one of my first heroes was uh, the great Bobby Watson. And, um, you know, he, um, my mom bought one of his records called The Inventor. Um, and, you know, I, I think for me, when I was a, when I was a, a kid, I liked playing the music. It was kind of like, for me, uh, how I feel about baseball. I can play baseball, but I probably can't. I'm not, it's not my favorite sport, you know, okay. you know. So I liked playing the music for a while, but I wasn't listening so much, like nothing really. Um, and I think that a lot of it had to do with the quality of the recording. Like my mom had some, you know, bird records, you know, um, she had, you know, she bought these bird tapes that I would, she would play. And um, I think this, the, 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 the quality of that recording kind of threw me off a little bit. Um, but then I heard this Bobby Watson record called The Inventor. And I love the, the, the you know, um, of course, the sound quality is, is, is modern. And I loved the way he composed and I loved his playing. And um, 
I really got into his playing and, and you know, became a huge fan. And I got to, to meet him eventually. And, um, you know, he became like a role model, you know, wow. for me. And he still is to this day. You know, we're, 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 we're still friends. So I, I listened to a lot of that. Um, Roy Hargrove, my mom played a lot of Roy Hargrove, who I thankfully got to play with for, for uh, you know, at least, you know, off and on that did some gigs with him for at least like maybe the five or six years before he passed. Um, wow. But, you know, I think some people that I wish I really got to play with, uh, like McCoy Tyner, um, Andrew Hill, Mulgrew Miller, who actually called me for a gig once and I, I, I was like, so I had another gig and I couldn't make it. Um, but Mulgrew, um, who else? Huh, that's a great question, actually. <laughs> um, Sonny Clark, you know, I'm, 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 I'm naming a lot of pianists and I, I realize I, 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 I feel as though those are the musicians that and, and drummers, um, but like Max Roach, I wish I could have played with Max, Elvin Jones, you know, um, musicians like that, um, or, or saxophonists like, uh, 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 you know, John Coltrane. Um, I wish I could have got to at least hear him live or, or oh, yeah. Bird, you know, Cannonball. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's funny I'm naming saxophones to play with. I, I would have loved to, you know, have shared the stage with them and just get the, you know, feel that energy, that live energy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, you said, uh, it's interesting, you, you mentioned a lot of pianists. What mm. what makes you think that? Um, Harmony, the harmony that they play, learning, you, you know, you, and, and I, it's not only the harmony, I guess, but as a saxophonist, um, and there, there are many artists that I think, you know, non-saxophonists that, that I could name. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, trying to think of different, these are guys, people that are coming off, that coming to me fast, but, you know, I, I, I even teach my students that, you know, other instruments have a different perspective of playing, you know, and they play different things that we don't play. So yeah. I, I, I encourage them to check out, you know, pianists and, 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 and other instruments. And there's a lot, the piano has such a wide range. You know, there's so much that a pianist can do um, and that they will do that maybe we just don't think about because of how we're playing, you know, because of how our fingerboard is. We don't think about the things that a pianist would do, but maybe they could transfer to the saxophone. You know, and there, so there's just a lot of things that I hear pianists do um, technically that I try to, you know, um, figure out and, 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 you know, put into my plan. Okay, I have so many questions I have to ask. Let me, so let me uh, go with this first one. Um, Roy Hargrove, what are, you know, some of your most fondest memories performing with him? Um. I think, well, we used to do, so we used to do uh, like New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve gigs at this place called the Jazz Gallery, you know, and I wasn't like a part of his band, um, but, you know, I would, I would do this gig, this New Year's Eve gig, and the, you know, for one, I listened to him a lot, a lot, like, you know, as kids, me and my friends would, you know, we would get the charts and we would listen to the records over. Like I probably could play his whole album wow. when I was 15 or 16. Like I, I could play all those records. I learned the music off the records. So just to be able to share the stage and like know those tunes, you know, um, was, was, was great. Um, the thing that I loved about Roy was just like, he embraced all styles of music and could play them. You know, so when we did those New Year's Eve st gigs, that's exactly what it was. You know, we would go from playing maybe some like some a, a, a funk influence song to you know straight ahead um, to you know hip hop, and he, I, I feel like that's the thing that I loved about Roy. Just he, he just embraced everything, and he was just such a serious 
musician. Like he loved to play so much. Uh, you would go to a jam session, you know, um, two o'clock and three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I would go to jam sessions after my gig and Roy would always be there. In fact, it got to a point where it would be strange if Roy wasn't there, you know. Wow. Um, he loved to play that much. And, that, and for me, that energy, like, I rarely, I shouldn't say I rarely, because everyone loves to play, but at that level, that he would, after his gig, after playing two sets, he would go and just hang and close out these clubs, you know, playing. And not only playing, but, you know, you know, I, I remember sitting in the audience and, him calling a tune and um one guy said i don't know it and roy said oh, you know and, and and that's the kind of person he he was he would he would say it's okay i'll i'll you know i'll show it to you wow that's cool you know? and he would show the show um show the musicians the, the song and another thing is vocalists he liked to play with vocalists so i remember you know a couple times and sometimes the horn players when the vocalist gets on the stage sometimes the horn players run off the stage you know they don't <laughs> but roy would be the one that stayed and i just like you know i started to understand the importance of that from roy haynes later on because roy haynes no play with all the vocalists you know and he knows all those um lyrics and all, you know but um, Roy just embraced everything, you know, and I, I remember one thing Roy said to me that, you know, I'll never forget, you know, because he was quiet around me. And, you know, we used to do gigs with Roy Haynes and he would just he would be quiet, you know. And um, one day he came up to me and said, man, know what I like about you? He said, you're not afraid to play bebop, you know. And at the time, I was just like, OK, I, I, I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't sure what he meant, but. You know, later on, I understand how, how much he embraced it and how important that music was to him. And it's become even more and more important to me to just to embrace the whole every, every era of, of this music, you know, um, that, that I'm learning. And it, you know, him saying that to me just at the time, it didn't hit me the way it did later, you know, in an encouraging way. Like it was almost like almost like saying you're you're on the right path or, you know, um, you know, you've for me, it's like a foundation that you've that you've 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 embraced and stick to that, you know, so. I'm curious. This is a great story. I'm curious when you were um, I have to remember the other question, too, that I've got to get to in a minute. But when you were first starting to learn jazz, do you remember how you were? how you were taught, in other words, like a lot of people are taught just starting with the blues and starting with the blues scale. Do you remember, mm -hmm. since you have good recall, <laughs> mm -hmm. do you remember how you were exposed to jazz? Um, it was learning tunes, you know? Okay. It was learning tunes. I don't remember, I, I feel like, yeah, maybe, I, maybe we did learn blues scales and bebop scales and stuff like that. But I think, I feel like overall, it was just like learning a bunch of tunes and it, learning out, figuring out how to improvise over them, you know, kind of using your ear and, and um, you know, maybe, you know, different chord progressions. And, you know, my, my, my teacher, if my teacher heard this, he might be disappointed because <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I, but, you know, he had me, my, my private teacher had me working out because I had two different, again, I had like the saxophone teacher and the ensemble, you know, the ensemble was learning tunes you know and we were we would perform you know we were performing like all the time wow. in philly wow. now the private teacher he did have me learning changes and you know learning lines over changes but i can't remember exactly what what you know what that was i just know that he gave me a lot of information mr wright did you with i guess with your private teacher um did he also have you going through classical material you know yeah uh, okay yeah and, and i think that's why i teach the way i do now is because it was a combination of you know learning you know standards and a lot of you know like technical um and i shouldn't say classical material like compositions but a lot of different a2 books you know so, so our yeah so our listeners know like which ones which ones did you study back then which ones do you have your students you know study now uh I remember there's a book called Bossi, B-O-S-S-I, 
that I studied with him a lot. Um, Mar Mar the Marcel uh, Mule, is that, is that yes. his name? Mule, yeah. Marcel Mule, the Guy Lacour. Um, wow. uh, the Furling, probably? Furling, Loyon. Uh, oh, man. Uh, That's, yeah, Universal Method, probably all those. those... I never really got, I, I, I just got the, the Universal Method. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, th those were the, those are the, you know, because the Bossy, I feel like we worked out of that a lot. And also there was some, like, there was a jazz book that was just like rhythms, you know, it was like really more about sight reading. Um, it that, wasn't the Niehaus you know, series, was it? It wasn't, it, it, it's like, I have it somewhere here. Okay. It's like a, a orange and white book, I remember. We oh, worked okay. out of that. Key Rhythms, maybe the Key Rhythms book. It was a, a German publisher. Um, uh, I, I could see the books. <laughs> There's um, a bunch of it's different- It's not Key Rhythms. I, oh, I don't it's think not, it's key okay. Rhythms. I know what you're talking about, I think. Yeah, yeah. All, all those covers kind of look the same. Yeah. The key, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like a very specific book that he had me working out of. That I, I, I just don't remember the name. Um, but um, I have it somewhere here. Maybe if I find it, I'll, I'll let you know later. But um, it's it's uh, it, it, those are the kind of things that I worked on with him. It was very, you know, I mean, sound. He had me working on sound a lot and, you know, um, etudes and, you know, different chord progressions, working over chord progressions and harmony, like, you know, dealing with dealing with dealing with harmony. But it was such a long time ago, you know, that I I don't, I can't get too specific. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but you know what I'm curious about? You mentioned sound and, um, you know, I've seen you with other interviews talking about tone and, you know, talking about equipment, but let's talk about sound in the sense of, you know, how you're producing sound and, you know, your tonal imagination and all that kind of thing. Like who, who are your main influences when it comes to sound and how do you conceive of making sound on your instrument? Well, that's a, well, it's a deep question out in conceiving sound because it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately just because I just started endorsing Selmer. And um, I, uh, I have my Mark VI now and I have this new Selmer Supreme, you know, and they're both great instruments. Have you heard about, you heard about the Supreme? I heard about it, yeah, but yeah, I haven't yeah. heard it yet. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I, I have this Selmer Supreme and you know, um, at first, one of the things that I started thinking about, you know, and, you know, when you, when, when you've been playing a Mark VI for all your life, you know, um, or any horn for all your life, you tend to lean on, you know, that horn as being a huge part of your sound. And it may be to some, to, to, to some extent, but, um, the one thing that I thought about when Summer contacted me, because, you know, I'm like, first thing I thought I was like, am I going to change my horn or am I going to, but then I started thinking, well, Charlie Parker didn't really have a horn at times, you know, and I never, I, 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 like, if you were to sit me down and play five different recordings of Charlie Parker where he's playing different horns, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, you know. So I started thinking like, man, you know, and, and, and I started realizing that, and I've kind of realized this before, but I can always, my sound is always going to be my sound for, for, for one, you know, and I think there might be some, uh, some slight differences in texture or warmth or, you know, brightness, but there are ways to, um, uh, to get to what you want, you know, by, um, you know, it's, 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 it's based on what you hear, you know, it's based on what, what you're hearing and, 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 and based on how you can manipulate um, the, the, the equipment that you have, you know, and you have to make the changes, but if you hear it, it'll come through, you know, so those are things that I've thought about with sound, you know, um, with my heroes, I've, you know, um, I think like the people that I've always kind of like, as far as sound, I've, I've, I've kind of like, uh, like the Johnny Hodges, you know,
I really gravitated towards like the, I really that was like when I heard Johnny Hodges sound playing ballads you know I've always thought about the ballads you know Johnny Hodges uh, Cannonball Adderley um, uh, uh, Bird you know um, uh, Ornette uh, Kenny Garrett you know and if I'm totally totally honest everyone I feel as though the more that I listened to different saxophonists, um, the more I was able to kind of pick different things. It's like the different, different ideas or different concepts of, of sound or how, you know, how Johnny Hodges' vibrato was or how um, uh, another saxophonist maybe played with a, a, a more of a straight sound with, 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 with no vibrato intonation you know the brightness of sound these are things i kind of like grab different things from different people and kind of uh grover washington jr another one oh, yeah, yeah. you know like i really love grover and the more i listen to him you know um lately i realized man this guy really had a huge influence on me as far as my sound and plus he was he was another guy that was in philly so i got to spend time with him too you know wow. but um i used to spend like an hour on sound every day, every morning. Um, when I was in college, I would wake up and, you know, I would be in my practice room at Berkeley. And, uh, you know, I lived in the dorm and they had these practice rooms downstairs. Mm. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna drink something real quick. <laughs> yeah, no problem, I can't, so am I. <laughs> but I used to, um, I would go down into my room and, um, you know, these practice rooms, and I would turn the light off. It was like this little, you know those practice rooms in the schools? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had this little room, and I would turn the light off, and I would close my eyes and just play low, long, long tones for an hour, as soft as I could, every day. Oh, softly, okay. You know, yeah, as soft as I could, every day, and... um. It was funny because from time to time, it, I, I, would, I would get to get to a point where it was so soft that some of my friends would come knocking on the door, you know, think, <laughs> thinking I was asleep or something like that, you know. <laughs> <coughs> you know. So that was something that I did every day, you know, just working on intervals and really trying to be able to understand the, the interval relationship. Um, as far as intonation, you know, and that's something that, you know, I, I tell my students today, like, you have to be, you have to be consistent with that, you know, especially depending on the horn you have, like, you know, that's one thing that I noticed. First thing I noticed between this Mark VI and this Supreme saxophone is that, you know, intonation of the new horns is like, it's, it's great, you know. Intonation yeah. Intonation of the older horns, you have to make those adjustments, you know. Yeah, but speaking of that, I wrote down a note to make sure to, to ask you, um, you know, what have you noticed between both horns? And I, I know, of course, intonation is going to certainly be one of those. And, um, you know, with intonation, how long did it take you to adjust? Because, you know, the, the Mark Sixes are quirky, <laughs> you know? Yes, it took me no time to adjust to the intonation. <laughs> <laughs> no time, no time. <laughs> Going back to the six, it made me think like, ooh, like I, I didn't realize that I had been working this hard on the six. Um, you know, the, the differences are, you know, um, and you know, I think this is the thing about the horns. Is the other thing is like every horn has its own, and, and, and I realized this about at least my horn way before I got the Supreme, because I tried so many sixes that were completely different, had diff different personalities. You know, they were different horns. Um, even with the Supreme, I had to pick from some of them to get the horn that, out that worked for me, you know. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, I mean, I'm not, like, I look at saxophones and mouthpieces like I look at cars, you know, even if it's the same model, like I gotta test drive it, <laughs> you know. I have to see what it is. Like I can't, you can't just send me a, a saxophone or, 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 or two, and think that that's enough. So I, I, I um, I tried 
different horns, you know, and it's different necks, and it's there's so much. There's enough to drive you crazy, and which I try not to do, you know. Um, but I would say um, the supreme, the supreme I have is just a a, a little bit brighter. Um, um, the um, the keyboard is just a little bit different, like the action, the um, E flat and low C keys you know, have, um, the, the, they're different. I think the low E flat and C keys I've heard are more like what the Mark, the later summers are like, they're a little bit thicker. Okay. You know? And that, that was like one of the adjustments I had to make. But the horns are, you know, they're, they're, they're similar, they're similar. And I'm still like trying to like, it's kind of even hard to, to, um, to even describe now because I'm still figuring, I was trying to figure that out, you know? And um, I think that uh, one thing like I tell, people have asked me about it. What do you, what, 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 you know, tell me about the horn or should I get one? And I say, yes, but I also say, you know, you gotta, you, you, you gotta try it out. You know, you have to like everyone like I, I, I think it's with, with saxophones. Like you, you should always be in a, get yourself in a situation where you can, you can try them. You can try a few horns, you know, so that you can pick out the best one for you. And for the equipment that you're using right now, so you know, um, I know you use Meyer mouthpieces, and not anymore. <laughs> well, not anymore. Oh, no. interesting. I um, so. I got this mouthpiece when I was at, um, and I shouldn't say not anymore. Well, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> so I, so I got this mouthpiece when, when, when I was in Berkeley, um, and it's funny because when I was at Berkeley, I was looking for a new mouthpiece, and Billy Pierce, who was the head of the saxophone department at the time, he used to have these. Um, he used to have something called Wednesday, W I N D S Day, where he would have. You know, master classes and um, and workshops and performances, and vendors from different places around the country would come in with you know vintage horn, vintage mouthpieces, and you know we could we could talk to them and buy stuff. And you know, this is my maybe my first or second year of school, and um, I'm I'm walking around and I see this. Uh, New York Meyer, and had always heard about the New York Meyer, you know, and um, I, uh, <laughs> so I tried this mouthpiece, and you know, I mean, this is my first year of school, I don't have any money, and the mouthpiece was amazing, you know, and I'm like, ooh, like, I'm, I'm thinking I can just get it right there, because, you know, as far as I know, you know, Meyer mouthpieces you know the new ones were like a hundred something dollars maybe you know even less back then so i asked him how much it is and i think he said like six or seven hundred dollars whoa and it was a, it was a vintage new york Meyer. i didn't know that much about it yeah I'm still so there. um so i immediately just put it down quietly <laughs> <laughs> but there's a repairman named emilio lyons that was in boston yeah and he like he knew me because i was taking my horn to him and he was like like two vendors down and he was watching the whole thing go down. So as I put the horn, the mouthpiece down, he's waving at me to come over to him. And um, I walked over to him and I said, uh, he, he said, um, come down to my shop uh, when you get a chance, come down to my shop. So I go down to the sh to his shop um, and I used to go there just to hang and talk to him and, you know, have him touch up my horn because, you know, I lived like right around the corner from him. So it was it was very convenient. You know, I've never lived that close to a saxophone repair shop. <laughs> but, you know, I used to go there. He would touch up my horn. But he he walked out. He, he, he saw me come in. And he went in the back and he came back out with a New York Meyer. And he said, give me $90 for it. And wow. uh, I was like. You know, I said the same thing. I said, "Wow!" And Emilio looked out. He he, he did look out for me. He 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 sold me my um. I ended up getting a, a Walt Johnson case, and he, he like he always kind of hooked me up and looked out for me because he knew I was just a young kid in college that 
you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even working at the time. I was just playing. I was just in school and, you know, I was just like, you know, going to the cafeteria and, and, and you know, uh, I just, I wasn't buying $500 mouthpieces <laughs> when I was, you know, <laughs> but he gave me this mouthpiece and I played it and played it and played it and played it and played it, um, until eventually I moved on to different mouthpieces and, um, maybe about four or five years ago, maybe more than that, I, every once in a while, I'll go and I'll go into my mouthpiece box and I picked, I found that New York Meyer. And I was like, man, I forgot I had it. And I started playing it and it's just like, I was like, wow. Like, wh where, have this, where has this mouthpiece been? So I started playing it and playing it and playing it again to the point where I'm just like, man, I need to maybe get a replica of this mouthpiece because if anything happens to it, I'm going to really be sad. I even thought like I need to record on this sound this with with this sound soon because if anything happened to this mouthpiece and, and I may have I must have jinxed myself <laughs> because sure enough I have a gig at the Blue Note um, with Nate Smith and I got a phone call and I was talking on the phone and I wasn't paying attention to my horn and I I um, had the horn on my lap and thinking that the horn was connected to my neck I stood up oh. And the horn just fell to the ground, like mouth, mouthpiece first, boom. Oh. And the mouthpiece was like completely shattered. And I, I haven't been that sad in a long time. I felt like I, you know, I lost someone close to me. Oh. And um, I went online immediately. And I think that's what really brought me down. I went online to see how much they, they cost now. And I was, saw like $1,700. And, you know, I was just like, there's no way I'm doing that. You know, so I did. I did an interview with Be Better Sax. I don't know if you know Jay Metcalf. Yeah. Yeah. So I did an interview with him, and we're talking about mouthpieces. And by that time, I had bought a couple on eBay, and they're you know they're cool mouthpieces. But you know, a couple mouthpiece guys have reached out to me, um, and one of them was this guy named uh, Navarro, Rafael Navarro, who's out and actually close to where I'm from um, in Pennsylvania, in Philly. And he asked me if he could send me some mouthpieces. So I've been playing on that lately. Um, but it's the same situation where it's like, it's something that he kind of custom made. And I feel like maybe I should go sit with him at some point so we can make sure if something happens to this mouthpiece, you know, I have a backup. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Especially, you know, um, I would say especially mouthpieces because mouthpieces are so personal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though you may get, you know, you may have a mouthpiece that is, um, uh, it's not, I don't mean the word stock, but, you know, you could just buy it easily and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and replicate it easily or whatever. But I think it's always good to have a backup just in case. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I did actually is when that mouthpiece, and, you know, it's, it's funny because that's how I found out that these mouthpieces are so different is I actually, I kind of started looking on eBay and, and I eventually bought the um, one of those New York Myers the anniversary models from Babbitt that they put out, I guess, a couple of years ago. And when I got it, I really felt like it wasn't anything like the Meyer that I had. Um, and I contacted them. I sent them an email and I said, look, I've been playing with your mouthpieces off and on for about, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And I'm realizing, is, I said, is there, is there something about you know, the, the year that they're made, they're kind of like, you know, Mark Sixes or, you know, um, because I'm realizing they're all very different. And the guy wrote me back and he said, every Meyer mouthpiece is going to be different. You know, he said, you know, I, I can't tell you about years or in, in, if there's any kind of vintage um, uh, year or, 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 or way to look back, but, you know, Every mouthpiece is different. And they do have the Meyer Brothers and New York Meyer from different times, but he said even those are different. And when he told me that, I was like, okay, I'm not even going to look in that, you know, in that way <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah. So now you have the Navarro mouthpieces and you're happy with that. Mm hmm Yeah, I like it. Yeah. C cool. So yeah. you know what, what I've noticed uh, with, your, with your sound, with your tone, your articulation is like crystal clear. It's, it's like perfect. Do you have any articulation tips, like jazz articulation tips you could share for the listeners? Um, I would say listen to Charlie Parker. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you know but like really 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 listen and that like to really listen to and i mean and uh, like i mean that seriously like i think sometimes people get um you know wrapped up in the technique that charlie parker had and that was amazing like you know his, his dexterity you know he like he, he could play fast lines and but you know i look at um articulation and things like that like i look at speaking you know um and when i think about the great like not that i'm a great speaker but when i think about the people that i like to hear speak you know and how they pronounce words and how articulate they are you know and i realize that sometimes i might talk fast or i might talk in a way that you know, not everyone can understand, you know, if I mumble or something like that. And I, so, I, you know, actually, Charlie Parker just made me more aware of that. He made me more, more aware of even talking, like, you know, being clear, you know. Um, and I think that's the beauty in Charlie Parker is that he had this technique, but he was able to put use that technique in a way that was... It wasn't about flair as much as it was about what he had to say, you know, and his ideas were very clear and um, his phrases, the way he was able to develop his phrases, you know, um, they weren't all long, they weren't all short, but he knew how to start and end his phrases, you know, and I think that that's one thing that I've always you know, and I shouldn't say I've always, but I started to think about, you know, um, as I was playing this, this, how Charlie Parker developed his phrases, you know, and, and the musicality behind it. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been something that's really inspired me, and I think that people should pay attention to. Now, if your students ask you, and they, they ask you this question about exactly what you just said, well, then how do I you know, how do I uh, think about starting and ending my phrases? Aside from listening to people, like, what do I do? What do I work on? Um, transcribing, you know, transcribing. I, I, I would say transcribing, really, because um, that's how you, and, 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 and not writing it down, but like actually transcribing the solos, you know, and, and like getting, getting into the head of the soloist. And, but you have to have it with that mindset of, I'm not trying to get these lines, you know? And I think that's what a lot of people do when they transcribe is they want to get the Charlie Parker lines or, you know, and I, I bought the Omni book and I had the Omni book for years before I started transcribing. I mean, before I, yeah, before I started transcribing Charlie Parker, I had the Omni book. Um, and then when I got into Berkeley and I realized that, wow, like, you know, um, I gotta hear this stuff, you know? I can't just read it. And I can't just play Charlie Parker's lines. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta hear this stuff, you know? And I, have, I just have to think, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is, is just your, 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 your thought process, you know? As I'm talking, I'm taking breaks. I'm not just talking, you know, I, and, and in fact, I can't, I can't, you know, um, just run on because I have to breathe, you know. But the more that you're conscious of the, your your breath and the space that you're you're, you're you're taking, you know, and the fact that you're communicating with other musicians, you're not just on your stage by on stage by yourself. I think that's how, you know. I mean, th those are the things that I tell my students to, to talk about, and not just saxophone. You know, all, all the students. You know. That's great advice. And yeah. speaking of like communicating, let's talk about your music and, um, you know, any projects. Well, actually, no, I'm going to get to the projects in a second. But in terms of conceiving your music, you know, and um, how do you, you know, how do you compose your music? What do you think of first? Do you think of the melody? Are you hearing the harmony behind it? You know, it's funny. I've approached it so many different ways. Um, I I like it. I feel like I I I, I feel more. Um, I shouldn't say comfortable, but 
I prefer when I when something just comes to me as opposed to it being forced. Okay, that answered my next question. Okay. So, you know, um, I could be walking down the street, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, and one thing I've been, I've had a habit, a habit of listening to podcasts when I'm taking a shower and I've realized that I got to chill out on that because that's when a lot of the music comes to me you know, when I'm taking a shower or like washing the dishes or walking down the street. Um, I'll, something will come to me and then I'll just go and I'll sing it to my phone, you know, the voice memo app. And then I'll go home and I'll try to apply the harmony to that, you know. Um, other ways is just sometimes I'll just be home, you know, um, just playing the saxophone and a melody will come to me, you know, and I'll write that down. Um, and, you know, another way is if I'm trying to work out something harmonically, you know, a, 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 a harmonic passage or you know, some chord progressions, or maybe just one chord. Um, sometimes I'll write something around, or a whole, the whole form of, of a tune. I have a song called The Heavyweight Champion. That's on my first record. That's based off of 26-2. And um, it's, it's, it's funny, I, the reason why I, I wrote that song was, I mean, I, I really liked playing 26-2. And um, I was literally, sitting at home trying to write something sitting at my keyboard trying to write and nothing was just coming out you know and that's that's when i get the most frustrated you know usually if i'm just sitting trying to force something and a friend of mine called me and he told me um he said hey man you know i i just watched you um uh i i had i had just been in the monk competition and he said, I just saw your, your clip of you playing 26-2 from the Monk competition. Man, it was so killing. It sounds so great. And uh, I was just encouraged. I said, oh, man, I, I, I like 26-2. Let me see if I can write something based off of 26-2. And I literally wrote that song within like an hour. You know, oh. I wrote it so fast, you know, and it was a little bit based off of his encouragement and me just realizing, you know, I can write a contrafact. I, you know, I can write something based on uh something else you know and sometimes i'll, I'll do that too I'll, I'll i'll take a song or take the, the harmony of a song and i'll um just you know write a new melody over that you know and then i'll after i write a new melody then i'll go back and look at the harmony and see what can i change in this you know to make it mine you know sometimes i just completely reharm i end up rearming that harmony to fit my melody you know things like that. That's great advice, especially for people that are interested in, you know, writing their own music and uh, creating their own compositions. And mm -hmm. speaking of that, you know, you know, we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> you know, with the COVID <laughs> the pandemic and everything. Um, do you have any new albums in the works? I have, I'm, I'm, I have some stuff that I'm working on now. Um, um, you know, some of, uh, I, I, I might be releasing something, some stuff that I've worked on um, um, soon. Oh, cool. Um, uh, when, I, when I say soon, I might, it might be within the next couple of months, you know, and it might be just on like Bandcamp or something like that. I'll, I'll release it. Um, I want to go in, I'm, I'm hoping to go in the studio and, you know, I haven't recorded with my quartet in almost, in probably 10 years now. Um, so I, in fact, I haven't released anything in, in almost 10 years. So I, but the thing is, some of the, some of the mem members of my band left town, you know, temporarily. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to wait for people to get back, you know, um, and I hope that they do come back soon so that, you know, I can go in the studio and, you know, if that happens, then, you know, maybe I can re release, you know, uh, 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 another record very very soon um with my hotel cool okay so yeah. now i'm going to ask some some generic questions and um you know you also teach as well what would be like the most important what is like one of the most important things that you want to impress upon your students just like one thing you could think of off the top of your head one tip that you know if your students um uh, like for 
the one thing that you want them to remember that you taught them? Um, I think the one thing that uh, I want them to remember is that, uh, and maybe it's two things, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, you have to be consistent and you have to love it, you know? And, 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 and I think loving it is going to help you be more consistent, you know? And you have to stay encouraged, you know? I think, um, you know, I, 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 I talk to them about, you know, it's, it's like anything in life, you need like a support team, you know? You need people um, around you that love the music just as much as you do and want to play with you just as much as you want to play with them. And um, they encourage you to listen, encourage you to check out music, you know, encourage you just to, you know, uh, uh, inspire you. You know, I think that's very, very, very important. Those are the things that keep us going every day, you know, um, and not just in music, but in life. Um, and I think that's the thing is like, just, you know, um, for me, we're blessed you know, um, it's a blessing to be able to, and I think that's the thing that I started thinking about with this pandemic, you know, because there are moments when I, you know, like now it's been almost a year, so you start to forget, what did I do again? <laughs> like, I, 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 you know, I yeah. got to tour the world, um, you know, playing in bands, you know, led by, you know, Roy, I mean, I've, I've been playing with Roy Haynes, you know, um, a master who has played with everyone from Louis Armstrong to Lester Young to Charlie Parker, you know, um, to Chick Corea, you know, who just passed. And Roy's yeah. 96 years old, you know. <laughs> wow. um, and that's one thing, I mean, that's one of the many things I've learned from him. It's just like, you know, um, just like, every, and he's, he's, he used to say that every, every performance, like, you go on the mic and say every moment is precious, you know. So now I'm just like, man, this is what I was doing for a living, you know, just to reflect on that. It's like, man, I was and, and it's not and it's not just about, you know, um, like playing or, or like it wasn't about me. It was about the like socially, like I'm I'm. I'm sharing something. It's a spiritual thing when you get out and you're sharing something with the audience. Um, and that's another thing that I tell my students, that, you know, is that when you're playing, you're you're um, you're connecting with the audience, you know. And I'm not saying play with the audience. This isn't about playing with the audience once they hear. But you want to make that spiritual connection with the audience because that's what this is all about for me. Um, telling my story and having someone being able to relate to that spiritually, you know, um, which is for me, it's not like me saying, hey, well, you know, I'm from Philadelphia and someone in the audience says, I'm from Philadelphia too, you know. It's more of a, it's a spiritual connection of how I feel, an emotional thing that, that travels through the air and it reaches someone else and they say, oh, I understand, you know. And maybe I need to hear that because I feel what he's doing, you know. That to me is what the beautiful thing about what what I was doing, you know. Um, and just you know, again, like this, um, Roy Haynes and Tom Harrell, who I who I got to tour with, who I keep in touch with, um, Dave Holland, who I just I did some big band stuff with him back in the day, but he. You know, we just played at the, he called me to do it, a Vanguard gig. And that was one, that was one of the gigs that I just like, you know, I realized how, how much uh, this um, uh, COVID, this, this, this pandemic has changed me because I, you know, the excitement that I got, you know, just to be able to play with Dave Holland at the Vanguard, you know, was that 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 rush it was like man i'm 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 playing <laughs> i'm getting to play again you know and you know and i have been able to I, I, not, not that i have been able to play again but um because i have done a few gigs but you know um when someone calls you to play at the vanguard or someone calls you to play at you know or do a big tour or something there's that 
that encouragement that, you, that I was talking about, that inspiration that keeps you like, you know, and I think that we all need that. You know, we don't all get it on the same level, unfortunately, but I think that it's so important, you know, that we support each other and encourage each other, you know. Oh, for sure. And, and yeah. you know, I was actually going to ask you, you know, how, um, how are you dealing with the pandemic in terms of, um, you know, having that connection and stuff. I mean, some of us on the West Coast <laughs> are kind of jealous because, you know, we don't have the, the opportunities yet. Um, I mean, we're making some opportunities, you know, but it's mm -hmm. not like what it was in the past. Mm -hmm. So, but how have you coped, you know, uh, during the pandemic? I mean, you know, um, I've done uh, quite, I've, I've done maybe about three or four gigs, you know, maybe five gigs. Um, since last year um, and that again has been encouraging I did a couple recordings I did one with Joey Alexander <clears throat> um, it's a great young pianist okay. from Indonesia and um, a vibraphonist named uh, Sasha Berliner Sasha Berliner um, she's a great vibraphonist you know, so I've been I feel like I've been able to in a small dose do things that I was doing, recording and playing. Um, I've had my moments though. You know, I definitely had my moments. And even like now, um, it's like, now I feel like, okay, this is enough. <laughs> you know, enough of this, you know. But at the same time, I kind of forget what exactly, almost it's like it's getting to a point where you kind of forget what it was, like how much, you know, cause I'm in a house, even just going out, you know. Yeah. I'm like thinking, how much was I going out? I was probably going out every day, you know, to do something, you know. But now I can be in the house for like, you know, five, you know, four or five days. And, you know, it'll hit me, you know, okay, you got to get out. You got to go for a walk or you got to, you know. So that, that, in that way, it's, it's definitely um, changed my perspective on just, you know, day-to-day -day life. And um, I think that even going back to it is going to be a shock you know when that happens it's going to be kind of a shock you know when, when when the gigs really start rolling rolling in and the tours come back you know which i really do hope they do they, they, they come back soon mm -hmm. um but i think you know the other thing is like i had you know i lost some of my heroes mm -hmm. you know um big comments was you know i become a friend of mine and um <clears throat> He's someone that, you know, I would have loved to have seen, you know, or talked to, or, you know, he, I didn't even know he was sick, you know, and then it depends, you know, the virus took him out and it's just like, you know, uh, you can't, you don't get to say bye to him. You don't get that, uh, yeah. you know, I, 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 I did an online, you know, thing with other saxophonists where we talked about our, our experiences with him, but just not to be able to gather and have you know gather and, and gather his memory um it's really uh i think that's that's the thing that that that, that you know think about mccoy and um jimmy heath yeah. you know who passed like right before the big pandemic but these are the guys that we want to celebrate them the whole year you know yeah. um charlie Par uh, charlie parker who's been going for years i was supposed to do you know a bunch of charlie parker you know, tributes, you know, um, last year, one of them is still trying to, you know, like they're trying to put on in, in the fall, but that was his 100th birthday last year, mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, you know, it's it's definitely um, done something to me, <laughs> you know, but I'm, but I'm, 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 I'm pushing through, um, a great thing that happened was I got married during the pandemic. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's awesome. So that was like the silver lining and, you know, all of this. Um, and, you know, just to be with someone, to have someone with you, you know, doing. Oh, especially now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's, been, it's been something that's, that's uh, I feel as though I'm thankful for, you know, now. For sure. And, you know, just to be thankful that, um, you know, we're still here. You know, mm -hmm. because this this pandemic has been something. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, there's no words to even describe it. And you know, so are there any 
are there any news of any like tours or anything um, or sh at least shows coming up or recordings with other people coming up for this year? Um, well, there's my recording that I'm hoping to do right. this year. Um, I'm supposed to do a Charlie a tribute to Charlie Parker um, in the fall in October. It, That's going to be in his hometown in Kansas City. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. That's going to be with, with Bobby Watson. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> so, and and I think the Kansas City Jazz Orchestra. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the music would be, um, but I, you know, I was supposed to do another one that was going to be a bird strings tribute. I don't know if that's going to happen. It's going to be re. Um, but I actually did that before. I did that in, in Paris, a bird bird with strings tribute, and they were trying to you know um, do it again for his birthday. But other than that, you know, I'm not. I don't have anything else. Oh, I have uh, actually. I'm I'm performing on the tenth. Um, I almost forgot. I'm with my quartet on April tenth. I'm performing um, uh, with my quartet. At, uh, it's going to be a live streaming from uh, uh, my one of my students actually started doing a podcast um, where he interviews different musicians called Brave New Sound, and he's also doing like live performances, streaming live performances. So he's he's having me play. You know. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, and I was actually going to ask you, you had mentioned that, you know, uh, you've got to stop listening to the podcasts when you're taking a walk or taking a shower or whatever. Which podcast, can you name like your three top podcasts that you listen to? <laughs> I listen to, um, I can't think of it now. It's a political podcast, uh, uh, NPR, I think it's called, just, I don't know what it's, what it's called. It's, it's somewhere, it could be somewhere on my phone, but it's. It's cool. It, I, they just talk about everything that's 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 been happening, and they give their take on it. Um, I listen to that. I listen to. Um, uh, I can't think. I'll, I'll have to look on my phone. Let me see. Let me. Where's my phone? Do I have my phone? I don't even know where my phone is. Um, <laughs> Put you on the I spot. Listen, <laughs> I listen to something called Apple Blitz, um, which, which is like all Apple, like tech geek stuff oh. um i listen to uh yeah no no i want to i want to look hold on give me one second okay Maybe maybe you can edit this to waggle look for the <laughs> Yeah, no no problem. And actually the Apple Blitz, I, I was just writing that down. That's interesting. Okay, I'm I'm curious about that one. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a tech thing, it's everything Apple. Um The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. I I listen to that. Um the, M the NPR Politics is is this name, the NPR Politics. Um Ridiculous History, um Classical Music Discoveries. Hmm. Mindset mentor, yeah. I actually I have a lot now. Now you know, open source. <laughs> I'm 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 listening to a lot of uh, different um, different podcasts. But you know this, I'm you know I I kind of I feel like I just kind of um, uh, got into them within the past year or so. Um, just really, there's so much information, you know, which I think is great, you know. Um, and different perspectives, you know, on things. Bill Maher, I listen to that. You know, sometimes I think he's just, he's a little, he's crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I try to listen to comedy too. I, I think comedy is a great thing to listen to, especially now. Yeah, especially now. You know? yeah. yeah. For sure. We all yeah. kind of need a good laugh at times. Yes, yes, we do. We do, we do, we certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me ask you uh, the standard question that we always ask. So is there, um, I think I know the answer, but I'm not going to assume. Um, is there a tool or, uh, yeah, I'll say a tool that you use under $100 that you can't live, live without when it comes to, like, music, whether it's performance, whether, you know, other aspects of music? A tool under $100. Um, what do you mean? I, 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 uh... I stumped you. <laughs> I mean, there's a read. I can my my read is under. You, you said something that I use that is for music. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, an, I'm keeping it to music. So something that you can't live without. It's um, you know under a hundred dollars. It could be something that you tell your students to use, um, or something that you know you use all the time. Oh, it's a read, definitely my reads. <laughs> Which are? Reads. Um, what, but but you know I I, I I'm a Dia Dario artist, so I I, I I it's not something that I purchase, <laughs> you know. Um, but I I'm using Hemkey three reads and um what is that and uh i use clarinet reeds on soprano um so i use uh, uh rico uh reserve clarinet reeds um pretty hard like three and a half three plus to three and a half on uh on the, on the soprano let's let's talk about that just for a second um i had recently put out a video about one of my students who was using um, tenor reeds on alto. And when mm -hmm. he told me that, I was like, what? <laughs> Never mm -hmm. heard of that. And But his sound is really, really good. So I started to recently experiment with that. And I was like, oh, this is definitely something. Although you mm -hmm. have to be careful with the intonation um, mm -hmm. on the high end. But can you talk a little bit about why you chose clarinet reeds on the soprano? Um, well, I... Um I was listening to a lot of like Sidney Bechet on soprano and I like when you hear him play like it just sounds like the setup is hard you know and he has kind of a woody sound he was a soprano saxophonist and a clarinetist and he his sound is is very full and it has like a a, a very like a woody quality to it you know and um I I always wonder like what exactly is he playing um, and uh, later on, when I started getting more and more into soprano, um, I was speaking to uh, Marcus Strickland actually, actually about about it, and he was, excuse me, he was talking to um, Branford Marcellus about it, and um, Branford was telling him that he plays very hard read. I think Branford plays like probably like a five, probably um, clarinet read, but he was saying that you know. Um, it gives it a fuller sound. Um, it's, 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 it's less bright. I feel like it has more of a body to it, like low end. Um, but also just the resistance, um, I think lends itself to the intonation and um, just the, yeah, the, 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 the intonation and, and, and just the a full sound. I feel like I, I, it's something I have to work on to control, but, um, once I, I'm able to do that, it's, it feels really good. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't go out of, it doesn't go, I feel like, for me, I feel like with soprano reads, it, the, the, the horn can get too bright and kind of like, there's not as much resistance as with the clarinet read, you know. Yeah, and do you, do you find, so going um, maybe up a, a half or a quarter strength will help the intonation on the I high end? I think so. I think so, but the thing is, you know, with that, you you have to be, you better be practicing regularly, you know, um, because uh, you know, for instance, like I play a three on my alto, and I I might play like a three, I've I've played up to like a four on the soprano with the with the with the clarinet read, and um, I've had you know like when I when when I'm going out with Roy Haynes, you know, I'm playing soprano and alto and there's definitely been moments when especially like the first gig if i haven't been playing soprano enough and i have that four read or three and a half read and we're playing i'm playing alto 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 and then we get to a song where i'm playing soprano it's like not happening you know <laughs> um and usually it takes by like you know like if I'm lucky and we're out for a week or two by like the third or fourth gig, you know, I'm, I'm in it because I'm now I'm going back to the hotel and I'm like trying to get my soprano chops together, you know, but after learning that, after having that experience, you know, enough times, you know, I realized the importance of like just picking up the soprano, you know, even if you, even if I'm practicing a lot of stuff on, alto picking up the soprano and doing you know doing the long tones or doing things i need to do to strengthen my chops you know and just going back and forth to 
back back and forth between any horn that you're playing, any doubles, you know, being consistent at that is just important. Because if you are in a situation like, you know, for instance, I played, you know, moving to New York, my first gig for years was the Mingus Big Band, you know. Um, I played in the Mingus Big Band for years and then I started doing gigs with like, um, get big bands, Count Basie Big Band. I played with them for a year. Then I played with the Vanguard Big Band and Dave Holland Big Band. And all of them had different doubles going on, you know. And some of those doubles, like, you know, I, I hadn't touched, like, flute. I, I, flute was probably the, o the only one that I touched um, after high school. Clarinet, barely touched it, you know. So when I got called to play with the Vanguard Band and go out in the road with them, and I understood, like, oh, I might have to take my clarinet, or I might have to take the... <laughs> I realized, like, you have to have a, a healthy rotation of those going on where you're spending some time just working on your chops and... No, it doesn't have to, you know, and I shouldn't say it doesn't have to. It depends on what you want to do with those instruments. Um, but if you, if you're, if you have gigs where someone might call you, which was the Mingus band, I would do some tours with them. Sometimes I wouldn't count Basie band. I was in the band. So, you know, I had to be, you just have to be prepared for whatever obstacles are, are, are going to come your way and my first probably about three or four years in new york was that it was like okay um vanguard band will call hey can you do this gig can you go out and road with us yeah um i mean mingus band i might get called the day of hey can you do the band tonight okay you know <laughs> then i'd be looking at my doubles and i'd say uh oh like i you know i haven't touched these you know so i think that's the, that's one thing that I've learned about like doubles. Um, now lately, it has been. I, you know, I have a baritone here too. Wow. That, um, yeah, and I, I've I've always been into baritone, so. Um, but but I, I I just got one recently, and I'm 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 uh, I, ha I haven't touched that barely at all, which is bad, you know. Um, but now I'm just I'm really focusing more on the alto and the soprano, you know. And if someone does call me to play flute or something, if it's something that I absolutely want to do, you know, then I'll, I, you know, I'll, I'll get into it. But I don't, I haven't been practicing the flute like every day, you know, or any or any of my other doubles. And that's one thing that I, I, I do talk to my students about, like at, when they're young, um, I tell them, you know, be prepared, you know, because that's how I survived for at least you know, five, six years, um, my f first five, six years in New York was, you know, just um, playing all these instruments. But eventually, um, you have to do what you, wh what you're feeling in your heart, you know. Um, you know I, I don't know how much Charlie Parker played any other instrument by alto, but he's one of the most important musicians to ever play it. And it might mean it might it might mean something that he didn't play other you know instruments and spent so much time on that alto saxophone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it, 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 I think it's different for everyone. Ultimately, it's 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 what you want to do. Um, and if you love playing different instruments, Eric Dolphy loved playing bass clarinet, you know, in alto. Um, Train, you know, Wayne Shorter, Branford, they like playing soprano and. And, and uh tenor and they're they're great at it you know steve wilson um kenny garrett um you know great soprano saxophonist and then we have someone like sam newsom you know who's like for me a, 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 another guy that i consider like a, a, a master of the soprano saxophone who stopped playing tenor basically to 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 play the soprano and, but when you hear I, I don't know if you've heard sam newsom's solo saxophone stuff but he's amazing you know amazing saxophonist you know what an interesting point too that uh no one's really you know um at least brought up on the podcast you know thinking back to certain people like charlie parker who really it's like 98 percent alto you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the most part it's it, that's a really great point um yeah. now before we go first of all thank you so much for your time it's yeah. so generous how can people find you online 
Um, I'm on probably every social media uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, website or, or, or what do you call them? Social media. Oh yeah, so so and social media, yeah. So like, I'm, I'm uh, on social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, it's just Jaleel Shaw, uh, J A L E E L S H A W, and I think Facebook is uh, Jaleel Shaw Music. Um, and I'm also on Bandcamp. Um, I have a Bandcamp page where you can follow and you know download my music, and um, uh, I guess I have a Spotify and and uh, Apple Music or TuneCore page. But I, I encourage the download and buying because <laughs> I'm you know I'm I'm a I'm a I'm an independent artist, um, and I put my own I, you know I started my own label and you know um, and put that out myself so. I definitely encourage everyone to continue to buy music, live music. I mean, not live music, but buy recordings. I hear you on that one. I, yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm not a streaming fan. I'm more, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I like to. I actually like to have the CDs in my hand. You know, right. something physical. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. <laughs> definitely I've, hear I've, you on that. I've one. gotten back into gotten to, to, to buying CDs too. I've definitely gotten back into that. Yeah, for sure. Well, listen, Jaleel, yeah. thank you so much for your time. This was, you said so many insightful things. And, um, you know, it just as like kind of a mini recap, it all goes back to how your mom exposed you to so much, so many different styles of music and how mm -hmm. that's, how that's inspired you and motivated you and encouraged you, you know, mm -hmm. to, to play with so many great artists and to put out your own music and how that's, that's, helped you with, you know, with your playing, with your tone, with your sound, with your compositions. I think that's so awesome. Yeah, it is. So thank you.